The date was April 23, 1985. The Coca-Cola Company, owners of the 99-year-old soft drink that had risen to become not only a household name, but one of the largest companies in the world, was announcing that the formula of the near-century-old beverage was about to be changed, ushering in a newer and better-tasting product. Then-CEO Roberto Guzueta proclaimed, The best soft drink, Coca-Cola, is now going to be even better. As I said, I think this is the surest move ever because the consumer made it. We didn't. Little did he know that even though all of the research showed that a change in the formula might be the next evolution of the beverage, the move would spawn a consumer backlash the likes of which had never been seen. It would become one of the most talked about marketing blunders in history. Or was it a blunder at all? The beginnings of the thought process that led Coke executives to consider changing the formula are traced back to 1975, when arch-rival Pepsi-Cola would pull ahead of Coke in supermarket sales. The latest Pepsi ad campaign, the Pepsi Challenge, had slowly chipped away at the stronghold that Coke had had on the soft drink industry. Coke was still the number one overall soft drink in the country, but the gap was closing. The Pepsi Challenge, an ad campaign that pitted Pepsi against Coke in blind taste tests, showed a clear preference for Pepsi over Coke. For the first time, Coca-Cola company executives questioned the universally accepted taste of Coke. As the 80s dawned, things at the top would change for Coca-Cola, as Cuban-born Roberto Guzueta was named the company's new CEO. One of the, his first major projects was the development and introduction of Diet Coke in August of 1982. Though Coke had issued low-calorie tab back in 1963, Coke decided to launch the diet version of their flagship cola to compete alongside its already successful tab. Diet Coke quickly overtook tab in sales and became an unqualified success for the company. By the end of 1983, Diet Coke was the best-selling diet drink in the United States, and by 1984, it was the number three soft drink overall, trailing only Pepsi and Coke. Back in the 1950s, Coke was outselling Pepsi by 2 to 1, but by 1984, it now only had a 4.9 percentage point lead over Pepsi and was now trailing by 1.7 percentage points in the grocery store market. Considering Coke was outspending Pepsi in marketing dollars by over $150 million, something had to change, and Goizetta looked no further than the taste of the iconic brand. After numerous trials and errors, the Coke chemists had finally come up with a flavor that tasted sweeter than Coke smoother than Coke, and less harsh than Coke. All the while, Coke marketing execs were touring the countryside talking to focus groups, asking them about the idea of changing the taste of Coke. These interviews met with a resounding no. Even those who were not loyal to the brand did not approve of the idea of changing Coke. When the new formula was ready for testing, the same group of marketers took their own style of the Pepsi Challenge to the streets, albeit quietly, asking taste testers to pick which they preferred, beverage one or beverage two, one being Pepsi and the other the new Coke. The new formula beat Pepsi by six to eight points. Coca-Cola USA decided to set into motion what was to become new Coke. Introducing the new taste of Coca-Cola. There's something big waiting for me and you, Coke is it, the biggest taste you've ever found. Introducing the great new taste of Coca-Cola. It's a hit, it's a Coke, Coke is it. After its release on April 23, 1985, what many people did not realize about New Coke is that at first, it was a success. Most Coke drinkers resumed buying the new drink at much the same level as they had the old one. In fact, a majority liked the new flavoring. Three quarters of respondents said they would buy New Coke again. But it was the southeast where Coke was king, especially Coke's home base of Atlanta, that the company met major resistance. Soon, the voice of the South would rise enough that the rest of the nation heard its cry of foul and began resisting the new formula Coke. A special call center was established to handle the barrage of calls received at corporate headquarters. By the end of the first month of release, the call center was receiving 8,000 calls per day. All told, the company would receive over 400,000 phone calls and letters requesting that old Coke be brought back. Less than three months after New Coke's unveiling, Old Coke was reinstated as Coca-Cola Classic. By the end of January 1986, Advertising Age reported that Coke Classic was outselling New Coke of margins of up to 9 to 1. 
Both beverages would continue to be sold side by side, New Coke changing its name to Coke 2 in 1992. By 2002, Coke 2 was pulled, leaving behind a failed project of epic proportions. Or was it a failure at all? As a Coke fan myself, I've often been fascinated by this story. I remember buying the new Coke and hating it at the very first taste. I joined the legions of fans who rejoiced at the announcement that old Coke was coming back. That is, until I had my first taste of Coca-Cola Classic. I remember well that something didn't seem quite right. It tasted like the original Coke, but not quite. It took some time before I finally found a reason as to why it didn't taste like I remember it, which is the basis of my argument, the new Coke debacle was a deliberate failure. As early as 1983, some top execs at Coke suggested that the company issue two Cokes, tweaking the taste of the original a little bit, and further suggested a sweeter version may be the answer. Still, the company has held that it was a suggestion that was dismissed in favor of introducing a totally new formula. Even after the taste test that confirmed the new Formula One over the tested audience, many in the head offices of Coke USA felt that, since the tests were so convincing, they should introduce a second Coke. Coca-Cola board member Herb Allen said, quote, do Coke two, but keep number one. Then president of the Coca-Cola Bottlers Association, Charles Millard, had said, quote, whether the questions of two Cokes was evaluated enough, no one will ever know, end quote. Even head executives at marketing powerhouse McCann Erickson, the company chosen to market new Coke, had expected the company to introduce a flanker cola, one that would satisfy those who were looking for a sweeter cola. When told by Coke that the formula was going to be changed, McCann Erickson president John Bergen and others were stunned. Even the competitors at Pepsi believed that Coke was about to release a second cola to stand alongside number one. As you can see, there were several suggestions about two beverages. Were they all dismissed or were they deflected? There's also something to be said about the numbers at the end of 1985. Pepsi owned 17.6% of the market share, compared to 17.3% for Coke Classic and 6 for New Coke. Combining the two gave Coke a commanding lead over its rival. It was also at this time that Coke changed their marketing strategy to focus on the total category of sugar cola beverage category, which included the two Cokes as well as Cherry Coke. After 100 years, the mindset had reversed. The events of 1985 also sent the company's stock price on a sharp increase. At the beginning of the year, the stock price stood at $61.87.5, but by year's end, it shot up to $84.50, an increase of 33.5%. By early 1986, Coca-Cola's stock had risen to a high of $110 per share. Lastly, let's look at an analysis of the product itself. According to The Real Thing, Truth and Power at the Coca-Cola Company, shortly after New Coke was released in target markets, Pepsi had their chemists examine the formula. They found that it contained fewer flavored oils and vanilla and that, quote, the new formula would save Coke about $50 million a year because it cut back on some of the most costly ingredients. I was somewhat suspicious at the taste of what was being called Coca-Cola Classic back when it was first released. Many who tasted the reintroduced formula were not convinced that it was the same formula that had supposedly been retired that spring. I discovered later that when Classic was brought back, Coke had secretly changed the sweetener base of the beverage from sugar to high fructose corn syrup number five. Some stores will carry Coke Classic, which is now referred to as Coke, sweetened with sugar instead of HFCS, and two liter bottles are manufactured during Passover that contain sugar. Look for the yellow cap on the bottle. This is where I found the difference in the Coke I drank in 1984 and the Coke Classic that was issued as the original in July of 1985. Let's look at the difference by the numbers. Note, Coke uses HFCS5 as its sweetener base, and one cup of HFCS5 equals one cup of sugar. The price difference between a pound of sugar and a pound of HFCS5 is 0 0.0275 cents. Americans drink an average of 125.7 classic Coke servings per person per year. Each serving contains 39 grams of HFCS5. Americans consume 4.9 kilograms per year. Multiply by 370 7 million Americans as of the 2010 census, and you get around 3.4 billion pounds of HFCS. If you do the math, that's a total of $93.5 million a year that is saved by using the cheaper HFCS5. Why would Coca-Cola change the sweetener of its classic formula? They had a perfect opportunity to do just that, and they did. What company on the planet would not want to shave $93.5 million off of their production costs?
I've shared this viewpoint with many over the years and it met with mostly dismissive comments. Even with all of this data, why would Coke commit such a major marketing flub, embarrassing themselves and risking the good name and heritage of the company? Why go through all of this effort, spend countless hours of research and development only to bring the original formula back so soon after the launch of the new version? The answer is simple. This was a win-win for the company. If new Coke failed, the company knew that they were bringing old Coke back with the cheaper sweetener. So Coke fans who wanted their favorite beverage would get it back. Coke was able to keep the original off the shelves long enough for fans' taste buds to kind of forget and not recognize that it was not the same beverage. If new Coke succeeded, they still planned to bring back original Coke, giving them two successful beverages on the market, similar to what they were experiencing with Tab and Diet Coke, and taking up valuable shelf space in the grocery stores. I suggest that Coke wanted things to end up the way they did because of the amount of money that they would save by changing the sweetener base. Still, enough people did enjoy the new formula that Coke did keep it around for about 17 years. In the end, they got everything they wanted. Change out the sweetener base to a cheaper substitute, lots of goodwill among diehard fans and the American public in general, and untold amounts of publicity. Even Roberto Guzueta himself said, quote, if I could do it all over again, I wouldn't have changed a thing. There's something big waiting for me and you. Coke is it. The biggest taste you've ever found. Coke is it. The one that never lets you down. Coke is it. The most refreshing taste around. Coke is it. Coke is it. Introducing the new taste of Coca-Cola. In this country, the best have a way of getting better, and Coke just did. From today, there's a new taste, a new standard against which colas will be judged. Coke is me.